Psalm 37 verses 1 through 4 I read as always from the King James text by the rivers of Babylon there we sat down yea we wept when we remembered Zion we hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof for there they that carried us away captive required of us a song and they that wasted us required of us mirth saying sing us one of the songs of Zion how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land I want to talk to us today briefly on the topic finding your song finding your song master we love you god we thank you for the presence of the lord that we feel in the house of god as always you keep your promise where two or more are gathered together in my name there am I in the midst of them. And Lord, we have a quota. We may not have a quorum. We may not have many, but we have a quorum. And you honor your word every time by descending upon this building and meeting with us, fellowshipping with us by your great Holy Ghost presence. Master, today, we need a move of God in the church. We need revival. We need our hearts to be stirred. We need our faith to be encouraged. Oh God, use your word today. Touch your messenger by the Holy Ghost. Anoint today that I might offer a word of encouragement, a word of inspiration. A word, Lord, that is uplifting for the people of God. We've been beat down enough in the world we've been beat down enough during the week struggling to make it by let the house of god be a place of sanctuary let it be a place of refreshing let it be a place oh god where we recharge our faith battery to face the week ahead anoint every ear to hear every heart to receive for we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. We have all been through circumstances in our lives where we just cannot for the life of us find any joy, find any positivity, find anything good. Oh, when things are going well, we run around singing. When things are going well, there's always a song in our heart. But when our circumstance changes, when things grow dark and bleak, and they are just not as we would have them to be, all of a sudden it becomes more and more difficult for us to find our song. Am I telling the truth? I'm going to tell you as a full gospel, spirit-filled Pentecostal preacher, I'm going to explain to you today something. There is a reason why the Lord Jesus Christ declared to the woman at the well that the hour was coming and now is when they that worship the Father will worship Him in spirit and in truth for this is what He desires. God is looking for people who can worship Him in spirit and and in truth, the problem in the church world today, many spirit-filled churches wouldn't recognize somebody being in the spirit if it busted them on the head and announced itself. I fear that most people in spirit-filled churches today have probably never even seen anybody genuinely Get in the spirit. 
There's a lot of folks over the century plus of the Pentecostal movement who have honestly rather misrepresented what it is to get in the Spirit. People will say, oh, the Holy Ghost got on me and I started dancing and shouting and I started running the aisles and bless God, the Holy Ghost really got on me. Well, that scares people to death. They think, so what are you telling me if I go to your church that I'm going to start acting crazy like that because the Spirit of God might just zap me and might just hit me in such a way and make me behave? No, no. That's not really what's happening. That is a misrepresentation of what is happening. When a Holy Ghost filled child of God is praising the Lord. See, when you come into church, you cannot help but praise the Lord. When you're standing there lifting your hands and saying, Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Thank you for touching me, Lord. Thank you for healing me, Lord. Thank you for filling me with the Holy Ghost. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for bringing me into the truth of one God. When we offer the Lord what is referred to as the fruit of our lips, it is those statements of praise and adoration. We are very much offering that to Him, listen to me carefully, from a place of the flesh. In other words, you're doing that of your own accord and your own volition. Nothing or no one is making you say those things or helping you to say those things. No, that is just coming from your heart. But there is a deeper place of worship that is more than simply praise, which is our efforts at lifting up the name of the Lord, our, our efforts at glorifying God. There is another place, there is another level in worship and that level we refer to as being in the Spirit. And what that means is, that means when you kind of recess, if I might say it this way, back into yourself, and you pull back into your spiritual man, so that you are really in touch with your spiritual inner man. And all of a sudden, everything outside of you pretty much disappears. You're not concerned about it. You're not really cognizant of it. You're not paying a whole lot of attention to it. You ever been doing something? Maybe, I know, I do it all the time. I'll be at home and I'm on my laptop and I'm working on something and I become so engrossed in it and Tommy will walk in and he'll say something to me and I'll grunt, uh-huh. And then all of a sudden I hear him saying, you didn't even hear what I said. You weren't even paying attention to what I said, were you? And I say, well, no. <laughs> because I was engrossed in what I'm doing. Well, we can become engrossed, listen to me, engrossed in worship. But we become so engrossed in worship that we literally kind of withdraw even from the boundaries of our own flesh and blood and we draw back into our spirit. And in our spirit, oh hallelujah, God is a spirit and they that worship Him 
must worship Him in spirit and in truth. When we get out of the carnal mind, when we get out of our own head, when we pull back into our spiritual man that has had life breathed into it by reason of the infilling of the Holy Ghost, all of a sudden we find ourselves kind of shutting everything else out. And in that state, the Spirit of God can touch, listen to me, our spiritual man in a way. He's not touching your body. He's touching your spiritual man that you now have kind of withdrawn into. You may be going through the hardest trial of your life. You may be in the worst circumstance you have ever faced in the entirety of your existence. The doctor may have just given you the worst news you've ever heard. The attorney may have just told you you've got to pay some huge fine or some huge amount of money. You owe the government, you owe somebody something. Any number of things. Your children may have just been found out that they are experimenting with drugs or they have an alcohol issue or a drug issue. You may have just found out, mother, that your daughter is pregnant out of wedlock. You may have just found out any number of terrible things. And oh dear God, there's so much going on in your life that is horrible and terrible. And suddenly you feel like you're in the darkest place you could possibly be. That is how the children of Israel felt when they were in captivity to Babylon. They felt like, Lord, Babylon is the most godless, the most heathen, the most unholy. It is the most ranked, uh, the, the most immoral society on the planet. And here we are, a people who love you and who love holiness and who love godliness and who are trying to abide and trying to live by your law. And yet we are having to live in this terrible place all because they have conquered us and taken us into captivity. And now instead of being free to worship you and live for you as we used to be able to, in Zion, in Israel. Oh, Lord. Now, we're in this dungeon. We're in this place of depression and despair and darkness. And they have the gall. The Babylonians have the gall to ask us, sing some of those pretty songs you used to sing in your temple. Sing some of those real inspiring and uplifting songs that you used to sing in your synagogues. And the people of Israel said, Now we've hung our harps up in the trees. I, don't, I can't find a song right now. There isn't a song in me. How on earth can I sing Zion's song when I'm not in Zion? How on earth can I sing of the things of God when I'm not even free to live the things of God? How on earth can I sing God's praises when I feel like there's nothing to praise God over? There's nothing to praise God about. Then the Holy Ghost steps in. <laughs> Ooh, I'm gonna tell you, those of you folk don't understand Pentecostal worship, you listen to this preacher, because I explain it, okay? A lot of preachers don't, but I do. I'll help you understand what's going on. All of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord comes down, and that lady who's just gotten the worst medical diagnosis of her life, she's sitting there praying and talking to the Lord and she's kind of withdrawn into her spirit. You see, your spirit 
is your safe place. Your spirit is your place of refuge. This is why you need the Holy Ghost. This is why you need the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It breathes life into your spiritual man. And your spiritual man then becomes, listen to me, the Tootsie Roll at the center of a Tootsie Pot. It's where you're trying to get to. Trying to get through the candy. You're trying to get through the hard shell till you can get to that Tootsie Roll in the center of the pop. And as a Spirit-filled believer, one of the benefits to the Holy Ghost baptism is we can kind of withdraw, we can kind of pull back into our spirit and that place becomes the place of refuge, listen, where God has a direct line to you and you have a direct line to God spirit to spirit oh hallelujah that's why the word of God says when someone prays in the spirit when they pray in another tongue as their spiritual man is praying and they're praying in a language other than the language they know and speak normally the word of God says they don't understand what they're saying God understands every word but listen not only does God understand every word but because when you're praying in the spirit it's your spirit and not your flesh the Holy Ghost see the Holy Ghost doesn't get in your flesh and move you and make you do things that's not how it works no the Holy Ghost touches our spiritual man and when the Holy Ghost touches our spiritual man the Word of God says that the Spirit of God helps us to pray. And when we pray in the Spirit, that is God helping us to pray. But listen to this. When we pray in the Spirit, every word we pray, this is what Paul said, is in perfect union with the will of God for our life. <laughs> We don't know what we're asking. Thank God. You know why? Because if we knew in our head what it was the perfect will of God was, we might not want to ask God to help us do it or help us realize it. The Lord may want you to go to Africa as a missionary. You don't want to go to Africa as a missionary. But when God touches your spirit, your spirit is praying and saying, Lord, help to open the doors to make it possible for me to do what you want me to do and go to Africa as a missionary. See, if you had knowledge of what you were praying, you'd stop yourself. You'd let your flesh get in the way. You'd let your self-will get in the way. Am I telling the truth now? You know I'm telling the truth. You'd let your self-will get in the way. So God bypasses all that by helping us to pray in the Spirit. And every word we pray in the Spirit is in accordance with the perfect will of God for our life. Wow. That's why Jude said in the book of Jude, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. He said when you pray in the Spirit, you are literally building yourself up. You're arming yourself. You're developing yourself. Your spiritual man is growing and putting on armor and preparing for whatever battle may lay ahead. Oh, well, listen, here's the wonderful thing about getting in the Spirit. You go to a church and you see folks, and all of a sudden that lady, she may go up for prayer. 
and the pastor may lay hands on her and he he might start praying for her and then all of a sudden you see her just start to dance you see her just start to let loose and dance oh all of a sudden she's not standing there with tears streaming down her face anymore now she's dancing maybe she letting her head roll a bit maybe she letting her hair fly maybe she's letting out with a hoop and a holler what you don't know is that her husband just asked her for a divorce what you don't know is that her child just had to go into the hospital and try to dry out because they have a drug problem what you don't know is that she just got the worst news anybody could ever get from her doctor and she went up for prayer and as she was being prayed for listen to me children the Spirit of God ministered to her not to her body to her spirit there's a direct line between God's spirit and our spirit when we are filled with his spirit doesn't that make sense if he fills you with his spirit, then obviously there's going to be a direct line of communication. Well, what happens is people get in the spirit. All of a sudden, God speaks to their spirit and says, Don't you worry about that cancer diagnosis. I'm going to take care of that mess. And all of a sudden, you see their spirit reacting you see their inner man having a response a joyous response a celebratory response they begin to dance or they begin to shout or maybe they just let loose and start running around the church because they're so excited and they're so full of joy they don't know what and I've experienced all of these things I'm going to tell you honey it is the most marvelous thing you'll ever experience in your life and we call it getting in the spirit. When you see people doing these different things, and a lot of times they, they do things that almost don't make sense physically. You're thinking, I actually have seen one man dance on the back of the pew. The little strip on the top of the back of the pew. You know, you got your padded back coming up here. And then there's a little strip of wood. I remember one time Brother uh, um, Bruce got happy. We call it getting happy. He got happy in the Holy Ghost. And he jumped up on the pew. Next thing you know, he was on that little strip of wood on the top of the pew. Literally, folks, I kid you not, dancing on it. How do you do that? There are people that train and train for years to be able to walk a rope, right? And here's this guy, he never trained to walk a rope, and he dancing on the top of the pew. He was so full of joy. He was so happy. Oh, I want to tell you something. Listen to me, children. There, If you ever want to find your song, get in the Holy Ghost. Get out of your flesh. Get out of your head. And withdraw into your spirit and let the Spirit of God touch you. Because when you get in your spirit, you will find your song. Hallelujah. In Acts chapter 16, verses 19 through 26, the Word of God said, And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, meaning Paul and Silas, were stripped of their clothes and beaten.
And after they had been beaten, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who, having received such a charge, thrust them into <coughs> the inner prison, he put them so deep in the hole, you've heard of solitary confinement, and they refer to that as the hole. Like you ain't going to get any deeper in the prison than solitary. Well, the jailer was told to keep them safe, and whatever you do, don't let them get out. So he figured, okay, well then I'm going to put them in the deepest prison. I'm going to put them in the lowest cell in the deepest part of this jailhouse that I can possibly put them in. And he made their feet fast in the stocks. So he put stocks, chains, locks over their feet. Oh, and at midnight, Paul and Silas whined and cried about their dilemma. No. At midnight, Paul and Silas complained to God about the mistreatment they had received. No. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. Hallelujah. Oh, even in the darkest part of the prison, even in the deepest cell, even with stocks on their feet and with stripes on their back, they were still somehow able to find their song. Hallelujah. Oh, they were able to withdraw into that spiritual place so that what was happening in their body, what was happening in their life, their circumstance, their situation, all of a sudden disappeared. And all they could feel as the Spirit of God washed over them was joy and gladness and thanksgiving. And they began to pray and sing praises to God. And the prisoners heard them. They made a lot of noise. You go to a Pentecostal church, a bunch of people shouting and yelling and running and jumping and dancing and glorifying God. Oh, it gets noisy sometimes. You should have been in the jail when Paul and Silas were praying and singing. Because everybody, according to what I read, everybody in the jail heard them. They were just sitting there. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, ye creatures here below. No. No. Their praise was coming from a place deeper. And they were bellowing the praises of God. And the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loose. I remember the first time in my life that I danced in the Holy Ghost. I danced in the Spirit first time. And after the service, I've told you, all these folks in a church I've never been in before in my life, it was my first time there at Riverside Church of God. And all these high hair holiness ladies and these men are telling me, Oh, brother, I sure enjoyed your blessing. It sure touched me today when the Spirit of the Lord touched you. Oh, it sure did. Oh, that really did something for me. And you think, what on earth are you talking about? How did it do anything for you? I know it did something for me. I feel like I'm flying on, uh, <laughs> like I'm high on dope, I'm flying high, I'm doing great, but how did it help you? Well, it's like this, when the doors of the prison, excuse me, when the prisoners heard Paul and Silas singing and praising God, God let his power come down. The word of the Lord said, God inhabits the praises of his people. Now, if God wants you to worship Him in spirit 
and in truth, then guess what happens when people begin to worship God in spirit rather than just praise Him in the flesh? Guess what happens? The power of God comes down. When the power of God comes down, it ain't just Paul and Silas who get liberated. No. Every prisoner in that jail, suddenly their door was opened and they were free to go. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you, when you're in a church service and the Spirit of the Lord begins to touch people and they begin to get in the Spirit and worship God in the Spirit. I'm going to tell you, the power of God will descend and you'll feel it if you'll just as sure as you're alive. You don't have to have the Holy Ghost to feel the power of God. I'm going to tell you right now, when the presence of the Lord and the power of God descends upon the church house, you don't have to have the Holy Ghost to feel it. But I'm going to tell you something. When that power descends, that is when you have, all you have to do is say, Lord, fill me with the Holy Ghost. And I promise you, in the next minute, you'll be talking in tongues. All you have to do is say, Lord, heal my body. And in the next minute, you're going to receive your healing. All you have to do is say, Lord, uh, uh, touch this situation or help this situation. And I'm going to tell you something, God's going to move. Because when the power of God descends upon the congregation, it doesn't just liberate the ones who brought it down hallelujah all of a sudden you'll see things happening you remember I told the story here uh, maybe on Wednesday night about this lady that needed deliverance and I went over and I laid my hand on her shoulder and commanded that spirit of unbelief to leave her and when I did honey the spirit of the Lord hit her she fell on her back and guess what? The power of God came down. In that minute, the power of God came down. All of a sudden, you could feel the power of the Holy Ghost in that room. It was like a bomb. I, I can't even explain it. And then the Lord said, go lay hands on Tom. And I went over and laid hands on Tom. And boom, he received the gift of the Holy Ghost. He'd been praying for it for a couple of months. But all of a sudden tonight, he gets it like this. Why? Because somebody got in the Spirit. Probably while we were praying for that lady. A lot of our people were standing around her. We were all praying for her. Somebody got in the Spirit, honey. And when you get in the Spirit, all of a sudden the power comes down. And when the power comes down, guess what? Oh, there's something available for everybody in the room. <laughs> it isn't just for the one who brought it down. It's for everybody in the room. This is why I teach. This is why I preach. This is why I have said for years and years and years, when we have church, people should be praying before the service begins. Because if people will be praying before the service begins, people can get in the Spirit and they can bring the power of God down before the service even starts. And then when somebody comes up needing a healing, when somebody comes up needing deliverance, when somebody comes up needing the baptism of the Holy Ghost, guess what? The power is already here. We've already brought it down. When I started my first church and Brother Chandler and Brother uh, Huggins came to do the organizing service, I was describing it to you a little bit earlier. When they came to do the organizing service, I've told you the story in the past, but for those who may not have heard it, and Brother Chandler, they were running a few minutes late, but all our people at that time, every one of my church members knew that before church even begins, you get in the altars. And all my folks were in the altars kneeling and praying and seeking God. Some would kneel at their seat, you know, and pray. But our people were praying. And just like Paul and Silas, oh honey, you could hear them. They weren't quiet about it. Oh, they were crying out to God. They were seeking God. They were getting in the Spirit. They didn't. When you get in the Spirit, there's a reason why 
when you get in the spirit, people whoop and holler and shout, and, and it's this loud, pitchy, you know, uh, shout. And they do these things they're doing. You know why? Because they don't even care that you're there. They're not even mindful that you're looking at them. They're not even mindful that there's anybody else in the room. When you see these things happening, that is an indication that these people are beyond you, honey. They don't care about you. You don't matter to them at that point. You follow what I'm saying? Because they're in a different state. They're in a different place. But I'm going to tell you, Brother Chandler said, he said, Brother, when we got here, he said it from the pulpit during the course of the service. He said, when we got here, he said, I opened the front door for my wife and he said, and I promise you, when I opened that door, we could hear the people of God praying. He said, and a wind, not a breeze, a wind came out of the building. He said, my wife's hair just went whoosh. You can literally see her hair flow with the wind that blew. And he said, my wife looked at me and said, my God, are we going to have church today? Honey, when people are already getting in the Spirit and praying the power of God down before church even begins, she knew that's what was going on. Man, you could feel the wind of the Spirit. You could feel the wind of the Holy Ghost moving. Oh, on the day of Pentecost, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all gathered together in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound out of heaven as of a what? Rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house. Didn't blow outside. It filled all the house where they were sitting. Paul and Silas could sing. And they could pray. And worship God in the midst of a miserable, painful experience. I believe because they knew how to get out of that old painful flesh and get into the spirit where they could commune with God by reason of His Spirit. And oh, I'm telling you, I've been through some experiences in my life where I was in a bad place, a dark place, a dismal place. But I went to the house of God and I said, Lord, I'm going to worship you in spirit and in truth because you're worthy. And I'm not going to let my circumstance affect me. I'm not going to let my situation pull me down. And I pulled myself back, so to speak, into my spiritual man. All of a sudden, I felt the Spirit of God hit my spiritual man like lightning. I've had people tell me afterwards what I did, because I didn't know. Sister Julie told me one time, she said, Brother, when you ran around this sanctuary several times, said you ran around the outside of the pews and you ran around. She said, and when you ran past me, I was praying for this woman who was seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost. She said, when you ran past us, she said, literally, there was a wind behind you. She said, and it literally blew this woman's hair. She said, I could see this woman's hair affected by the wind that the Spirit was just, I mean, all over you. She said, all of a sudden, that woman threw her hands up in the air and rubbity bubbity bubbity bump began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave her the utterance. God filled her with the Holy Ghost. Why? Because the one that gets in the Spirit doesn't bring the power down for themselves. They bring it down for everybody around them as well. Hallelujah. And after the service, Sister Julie Maston, bless her soul, I love that lady. She's telling me, oh, when you, I was singing a song. <laughs> All of a sudden that song hit my spirit. I'm telling you, there was some lyric in the song we were singing and it hit my spirit. All of a sudden, I mean to tell you, I went out. It's almost like in the flesh, 
forget it. I just, I just went out. I just buzzed out, phased out, whatever you want to call it. And all I knew is in my spirit, something wonderful was happening. She said, oh, when you ran past us and you were, I said, I didn't run past y'all. She said, you sure did. I said, no, I didn't. I said, I said, I think maybe I danced a little. She said, oh, no, honey, you didn't dance. She said, you ran around this whole sanctuary about three or four different times. I said, are you sure? Because literally, I, that is how disconnected I was from what happened when I got in the Spirit. And I literally got in the Spirit while I'm singing this song. It happens. Job chapter 38 verse 10 But none saith Where is God my maker Who giveth songs in the night Psalm 42 verse 8 Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness In the daytime And in the night his song shall be with me and my prayer unto the God of my life. Psalm 77 verse 6. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with mine own heart. And my spirit made diligent search. In Ephesians chapter 2 verses 4 through 6. The apostle Paul wrote. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together, and made us sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Jesus. Paul says, I, I'm paraphrasing a little bit. When you get in the Spirit, <laughs> you go up where He's at. You start looking at your problems from His perspective. You start seeing your issues from His perspective. And guess what? From where Jesus says, they nothing looks big. There ain't nothing looks powerful. It nothing looks troubling. It nothing looks impossible. No, no, no. Not from where He sits. And Paul said, oh, but thank God. He makes us to sit in heavenly places with Him. Oh, hallelujah. I want to tell you, when you get in the Spirit, honey, I promise you, you the first time it ever happens to you, you're going to know what I'm talking about. You are sitting in heavenly places with the Lord. Lastly, today, 1 Peter, Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 9, Blessed be the God and or even Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope or a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time now listen wherein ye greatly rejoice though now for a season if need be ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Verse 8. Whom having not seen ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, listen, ye rejoice 
with joy unspeakable and full of glory. <laughs> Woo, I'm going to tell you, you get into a service where the power of God starts to move. You get in a church service where the Spirit of the Lord starts to move and the Holy Ghost descends upon that place like He did on the church in the book of Acts. You get in a church where you see the move of God like this, and honey, you're going to understand what he was talking about. It is joy unspeakable. It is joy you can't even put words to. And full of glory. Hallelujah. Oh, there's an old song we used to sing. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Full of glory, full of glory, it is joy unspeakable and full of glory, and the half has never yet been told. Finding your song, I'm going to tell you where to find it. Your song is always in your spirit. You just got to bring it out. But you can't bring anything out of the closet until you open the door and get in the closet. Amen? You might have a mop in your broom closet, but you can't use that mop till you open the door, get in the closet, and pull out that mop. Am I telling the truth? Your song is in your spirit. You may not feel it in your head. You may not feel it in your heart. You may not feel it in your emotions. You may not feel it in your flesh. But honey, it's in your spirit. And I'm here to tell you, if you learn to just pull back and just focus on the Lord and let everything and everyone that's one reason why when we worship people close their eyes because it literally is helping us to focus on the Lord and, and not be aware of what's going on around us. Not be aware of people around us. There are people who would be embarrassed out of their mind if they knew that they were shouting and dancing all over the front of the church house. But when they get in the spirit, they're going to shout and dance all over the front of the church house. Hallelujah. Why? Because in that state, they could care less about who's watching. They could care less about who's looking. Remember David dancing before the ark of the Lord, the ark of the covenant? And his wife said, oh, you made quite the fool of yourself today. David said, you know what? I could care less. I was worshiping God. The only, the only one I was performing for was Him. I wouldn't, I wasn't looking for you to appreciate what I was doing. I wasn't looking for Israel to appreciate what I was doing. I wasn't looking for the priests to appreciate what I was doing. I was worshiping God. And that's what worship in the Spirit is. It's when we find our song. It's when we retreat into our spiritual man and give God an opportunity to, by His Spirit, to reach out to us directly, person to person, by the Spirit, and touch us, touch our faith, give us hope, offer us a promise, give us the answer, and all of a sudden we'll find our body reacting with our spirit to what's happening inside of us, and we start shouting, and we start jumping, and we start getting happy, because God just said, I've done it. It's finished. It's taken care of. Oh, I'm going to tell you, there have been a number of times the Lord's done that with me. I was in a situation and I couldn't see any way out. All of a sudden, the Holy Ghost would touch me and say, It's done. I've taken care of it. And I started shouting. Now, it wasn't done that I've seen. I didn't see it done yet. But when God says it's done, honey, it's as good as done. And guess what? I literally would go home from church and within an hour or two hours all of a sudden that exact situation that I was so beaten down by, that I was so oppressed by, suddenly the resolution came. And it came in a way, it came from a source that I never dreamed in a million years. I couldn't have thought of that answer. 
God found a way to do it for me in, in, in a way I never even imagined. Oh, children, I'm going to tell you something. When the Spirit of the Lord reaches out and tells you, it's done. I've taken care of it. Oh, you're going to shout. You're going to get happy. When the Spirit of the Lord reaches out to you and says, you're healed. When I was in that hospital bed and I finally decided God gave me the option if I wanted to stay or leave and I had to figure it out and he told me you need to figure it out because next time I ask you I'm not going to let you change your mind when I finally figure it out hey Lord I need to be here I've got a work to do you called me to do something and I'm not done yet when I finally got all that figured out and the spirit of God spoke to my spirit and said you shall not die but you shall live. I didn't immediately recover. I wasn't immediately healed. But you know what? When my mother came, I wrote with that crayon on that paper, I'm going to live. I knew it as sure as I was alive, I knew it. <laughs> you know why? Because God said it. She said, how do you know? I said, God told me. Oh, sweetheart, I'm going to tell you something. When you live this good old-fashioned Holy Ghost religion that this preacher preaches, I'm here to tell you today, when God speaks, it's as good as gold. It's done. And you will see it in short order come to pass, I assure you. But that's why when you go to some of these Holy Ghost churches, you see people getting happy and shouting and leaping and jumping and running and dancing. That's not God taking them like a puppet and making them do something. No, 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 no. That is God ministering something to their spirit and helping them find their song. And they begin to rejoice. And they begin to celebrate. They begin to get happy. Or sometimes I've had it where the enemy was fighting me and man, I was going through a battle like you wouldn't believe. And I got in the spirit and I found myself just going like this. In my spirit, I was stomping on the enemy's head. I was beating him down. I was putting him under. But I was in the spirit, you know, and I'm just standing there and I'm just doing this. And everybody around me don't know what's going on. You don't have to know what's going on. That's the whole point. <laughs> when somebody's in the spirit, they're not about you. That's between them and God. But you know, there's blessings in others getting in the spirit because when others get in the spirit remember what i said they bring down the power of god and the power of god benefits everybody oh i'm gonna tell you i can't wait to get to nashville and find my song hallelujah and i hope that